Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot. I'm Managing Director and Head of Research here at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today, and we're going to hear from Baseload Energy Management CEO James Sykes. James? Thanks, David. Very yeah. happy to be here. Uh, first, I'd like to take a brief moment to recognize today, September 30th, 2021, as Canada's first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation reconciliation, which is an evolution of Orange Shirt Day here in Canada. Uh, today honors the memory of the children that were lost, the survivors, their families, and the communities of all those who have been affected by the tragic and painful history of Canada's residential schools. Today is a day to reflect on the past and ensure that such targeted mistreatment of people, of their cultures, does not happen again in Canada or the rest of the world. Baseload is proud to say that we work directly with ind Indigenous communities and businesses, and we support Indigenous youth exploring careers in the mining and exploration industry who are committed to preserving their cultures through our Or Group Indigenous Scholarship in partnership with the Young Mining Professionals Scholarship Fund. Thanks, David. Thank you, James. So during today's webinar, James will provide an overview and outlook of the company, and then we're going to take some questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. But before we kick things off, first, first we need to discuss the fine print. During this baseload webinar, forward-looking statements may be made, and I would direct listeners to its forward-looking statements outlined on page two of the baseload company presentation. That can be uh, found on the company's website, baseload.com. Com. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this webinar is for informational purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. So please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on baseload energy. Now, before James steps up, I would like to say a couple words. You know, uranium prices have really been on a tear this year in 2021, and more specifically since early August. Now, while 30 to 32 bucks a pound has really been the normal range for most of the year, the UXC broker average price peaked at 51.12 on September 17th. And we do believe this movement was both due to uranium price trading volumes and to speculation. The activity spurred on a run on the uranium equities, and as usual, with periods of stark volatility in the commodity price, we do see investment risk reward play out in the markets. Producers were up sharply, I'd say 42% month over month, but the explorers and developers, uh, you know, such as uh, a base load, were up more between 50 to 60% on average uh, month over month. Now, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, they issued $245 million in equity through early to mid-September, and the company purchased 6.5 million pounds in the market and really was the underpinning of driving the pricing up from 30 to 40 bucks a pound. Then Sprott decided to increase its shelf prospectus from 300 million to 1.3 billion, leading to additional speculation that would be raising more money uh, in the market and uh, therefore buying a lot more pounds in the in the market. And we do believe this has been playing out, but we also caution, you know, a little bit too much too soon. You know, we'd love to see a more sustainable rise in the spot market, so we really don't get these rapid uh, pullbacks in the spot price. You know, we have seen the uranium price pull back to 43 bucks a pound as of yesterday. Uh, and because of that, over the past two weeks, most stocks appear to be off 15 to 20 percent. And, you know, there are ex exceptions such as baseload, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, we do believe Sprott is going to provide a re-rating on this uranium market, but we also believe that long-term contracting is the most important driver. The world uses about 177 million pounds of uranium annually, and as spot and term prices both rise and converge, we believe that long-term contracting will increase. So bottom line here, we like the fundamentals, driving the uranium prices higher. Uh, with disinvestment in the sector over the past several years, there has been a lack of exploration and discoveries, and new mines uh, will be needed in the coming years to replace mine closures, let alone cover the growth in uranium demand. So with that said, I'm going to now turn it over to James to update update the audience on baseload energy. James. Thank you very much, David. 
Excellent. So I'm here to talk about Accio, which is a new near-surface uranium discovery in the Athabasca Basin area. Uh, Basal has been around for about a year now, and so this has come very quickly for us, and we're all very excited. We also want to get uh, you, the viewers, excited as well. As mentioned, forward-looking statements, they will definitely be made. So here is our disclaimer. Very quickly, Accio, again, new, new near-surface uranium discovery, kind of goes along with our Athabasca 2.0 strategy. So it, it fits nicely with, with our model. Uh, myself as CEO, continuing to deliver with a proven track record of discoveries. And I hope that this trend just continues. We are fully funded. We just closed a raise, raise of $7.6 million. Uh, puts aside $11 million in the treasury. And we've got very tight capital structure with about 30% of the, of the shares controlled by insiders. We've got amazing projects, which I'll touch on later as well, that we think have equal opportunities for discovery. And as Dave just mentioned, the uranium fundamentals in the market are, are very strong. It's an exciting time. So Accio and the GMZ. Uh, the GMZ is the Gemini Mineralized Zone, which was discovered by 92E, uh, an Australian listed company to the northwest of our project. Now they made a discovery on the whole GEM04 which reported 5.3 meters of 760 CPS and includes 0 0.7 meters of 1500 CPS. Now we had just started drilling down at our Beckett zone in the south there, those red dots. We were on our second hole when that news came out. We really liked Beckett and decided to stay there, but we also saw the news and found it to be very prospective. We also knew that with our gravity survey, there was a large gravity low up there. So it kind of fit with, with our exploration uh, targeting going forward as well. But doing some extra digging, we uncovered uh, based, on, based on the targeting that 92E had done targeting a conductor, we found a, uh, I guess, a 10-year-old 10 10-year-old 10 EM survey that showed there was a conductor in the area that crossed onto both projects. Now uh, this, this conductive anomaly uh, coincides with the gravity low as well. So it's a nice target area. I measured about 1500 meters long. That should be uh, 1.5 kilometers, not 1500 kilometers and 350 meters wide. So it's, it's quite an exciting target, but what you can also see there are two drill holes and both of those triangles on there are the mineralized intercepts. So you've had two drill holes into this large anomalous area and they both intersected uh, high levels of radioactivity, confirmed uranium mineralization on the GMZ side. And once our samples are returned back from the lab, I'm hoping that we will see the exact same thing, confirmed uranium mineralization on our end. Right now, we're just reporting radioactivity. So to put, to put the, the, the 92E hole into perspective, the 5.3 meters of 760 CPS, that came back as 5.5 meters at 0.12. And their higher grade intercept, 0 0.7 meters of 1500 CPS, came back as one meter at 0.28. Now these are pretty exceptional grades, especially when you consider that back in the 1980s on Denison's Wheeler project, the operators at the time drilled a hole called ZK06. Now ZK06 intersected 7.7 .7 meters at 0.17%, U308, which is very comparable to what we're seeing in whole GEM04. 34 years later, Denison comes and drills down dip of, of ZK04, and they discovered the Griffin Zone, which is now a which now has more than six, 60 million pounds of uranium hosted in basement rocks at over 1% U308. So we're kind of using this type of idea to say that, hey, this this whole GMZ and Accio zone has the potential for massive tonnage near surface. And this is what's really exciting about this whole play. This is, we're just going off two drill holes right now. And this is what we intersected. So if you, you know, if, if you take the radioactivity results that we, that we reported in our news release and show here 16.2 meters of 642 CPS, that's very comparable to the drill hole from 92E uh, GEM04, that, uh, five, at, which had 5.3 meters of 760. So the CPS are very comparable, but there's uh, quite a bit more width in, in this intersection. Higher grades, or sorry, higher CPS on, on our whole HK2107 compared with the GEM04. But it's still showing that this system is robust. 
how often do you have two drill holes that are 450 meters apart intersect high levels of radioactivity, intersect extremely strong alteration? Very rare from, from what I'm aware of. So this is a cross section looking down the strike of this 450 meters. I bring this to your attention very early on is because there's one substantial difference that you can see in, in between the two drill holes and that's right beneath the overburden, the overburden being that, that brown feature on top, right beneath it on hole, hole seven is the yellow polygon, which are the Athabasca sandstones. So we did intersect Athabasca sandstone, whereas the other hole did not. And that kind of points toward being a structurally controlled setup. This is a, uh, that, that we're in a valley in this area. And you can see faults in this. You can see faults in the sandstone here. So at 57.4 meters, you can see that the sandstone layers are offset. And there's even a little bit of uh, wispy hematite to it along along that, that offset. Indicating that, yes, these this area has been structurally active in the sandstone. And to look at the unconformity, here's your unconformity. Now, a lot of the sandstone that I have seen, I will be very honest in that it doesn't look like a typical unconformity style deposit, but that's not a bad thing. Again, we're still in our first drill hole. When you consider that the faults could be oriented in many different directions, such as more moderate to shallow dipping faults, and if we just project from uh, from the intersection gem 04 towards the middle of the drill holes, you can kind of get the idea that that this mineralized system could go, and more than likely will go right up into the sandstone. And this presents the possibility for unconformity mineralization. Or if you look at structures the other way, maybe they're vertical, but again, the idea for, for an unconformity style mineralization definitely exists in these project areas along this this whole uh, this whole geophysical anomaly, and that's that's huge. That's very exciting because you hear a lot about unconformity deposits. You know that that was the the driver model for exploration in the Athabasca for many years, and it still is today. But it it is a great model. It works. There are a number of de discoveries made with an unconformity. Probably more unconformity deposit pounds discovered than basement hosted pounds. So it just adds a whole nother layer of exploration. And again, you can see that the the sandstone is very shallow. So if there is an unconformity mineralization in this area, you could be within 50 meters of surface, which is pretty well open pit material right there. So just showing the anomalous area uh, with gravity in the background, there's the, the EM anomaly. You know, we can interpret that the sandstone does it whether it fingers out this way or there are islands of it but it just seems to be this this fault controlled deposition of the sandstone uh, very similar to key lake you can go to key lake and find a, a similar feature with athabasca sandstone fingering out along the fault with islands along the way and four deposits along the the key lake trend with this with this uh with this setting Immediately below the unconformity is another feature that I love. I, I really love seeing these type of rocks. It may not be completely apparent, but if you look at the rock, you can kind of see yellow or you can see green and red. Now, this is a hematite breccia. The hematite is the matrix. That's the fluid that has been in there. And all of the green minerals are clasts of, of the rock that was there before, before the red fluid came in. If you've seen some of my presentations beforehand, these red fluids, these iron-rich fluids, uh, hematite, they are carrying uranium. This is your uranium-carrying fluid. That's what we're looking for. Where else have I seen this? Aero deposit. This is taken from a presentation I did in 2014, and I can also attest that there are a number of similar type of hematite breaches in close proximity or directly associated with other uranium deposits. But you take Arrow, for example, and if you look in the, the cross section where you've got all the hematite just below the unconformity, that's the, your drawdown mechanism. That's where your, your sandstone fluids are coming down into the faults. So these, these hematite breaches are not necessarily radioactive themselves, but they are the potential fluid pathways for discovering more for discovering mineralization. So we're very happy to see that early on in our drilling. 
Now, just as a, as another example on the left hand side here is the basement, uh, the basement mineralized model, whereas the right hand side is that unconformity. And so the way that we kind of interpret this is that your your sandstone fluids flow down into the structure. And this is this is where you can map out these uh, these hematite breaches to to be the vector to possibly be the vector for uh, for your mineralized fluid pathways. Whereas it's a little bit different on the on the unconformity side because you do have mineralization right there at the unconformity, and the structure has has uh, constantly forced it up, so you won't really see those uh, those hematite breaches. And then also right near the Right near all of this, we are seeing these late faults. So in this picture, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, you can still see some of that hematite brecciation, but that has been overprinted with later faulting. So we know that this is a very active area, that uranium has come in, there have been, or the, the right fluids have come in uh, that could have carried uranium, but then this whole area has been reactivated with other faults. And that's what we want to see. We need to move fluids. You need to move fluids in the basement rocks. The only way to do that is with structure, structure, structure. So we're seeing that. Everything that we've seen so far in a huge alteration envelope brings us to this, brings us to a nice intersection of, of elevated radioactivity. When I look at this core, I can see many similarities to Rough Rider. So having spent a number of years on Rough Rider uh, and started piecing around some of the ideas from, from roll front deposits and applying it to these structurally controlled Athabasca style deposits, you can start to pick out similarities here. So when I, when I say roll front, what you're looking for are those basically those red zones uh, adjacent to the gray zone. So your oxidized rocks adjacent to your reduced rocks. Where you get those moving or remobilized, you would get lesser red zones. You would get these, these yellow zones and maybe even bleached red. And we can see quite a bit of that. So without seeing the rocks in person and just looking at these pictures, uh, I would hazard a guess that we're not quite at the right oxidized front here, that we need to find that redox front where it really happens. And I don't think this is it. I think this is a remobilized section that will that has shifted uranium into another location, into another trap. So this is this is the extreme, extremely exciting potential that we have at Accio alone. It's absolutely amazing. There's uh, so we will continue drilling there and hopefully be able to map all of that out. So again, to put things into perspective, to the north of us whole GEM-04 intersected 5.3 meters of 760 CPS. We intersected 16.2 meters of 642 CPS, a little bit higher and more frequent, uh, higher radioactive anomalies within our drill hole, but the area is large. This is 1.5 kilometers, 350 meters wide. More drilling, and as you explore something like this, I, the chances of discovering a MacArthur River pod two, what's what's pod two dimensions, 100 meters by 80 by 60. You could fit a number of those pearls on a string within this within this huge anomaly. So that's that's where all of this potential really builds up that this could be a very exciting area for both companies involved. And it fits. It fits the Athabasca 2.0. So the big thing with the sandstone in Athabasca 2.0 is you can't have over 100 meters of sandstone thickness. We've got about 20 meters to 30 meters of sandstone thickness where we just saw it on our side. So we still fit very nicely within that black circled area for Athabasca 2.0 style deposits. And one of the things that we have been promoting a lot for, for Athabasca 2.0 is that it's about the economics. And we are looking at trying to make a near surface discovery that could go into development. Adding on top of that, uh, the Accio, Accio GMZ area is the yellow star on the hook project, but adding on top of all that is we're near infrastructure. We're 30 kilometers east of a highway, uh, Highway 914, and power lines that supply the Key Lake Mill and the MacArthur River Mine. As the crow flies, we're 70 kilometers northeast from the Key Lake Mill. So we're right near infrastructure. Everything's great in the area. 
And just another little side note, uh, from all our, our, our all-in costs, from staking to geophysics, ground exploration, to drilling up to the discovery hole, we spent a total of $1.5 million to make that discovery. In my books, that's a huge win for investors that we have, uh, you know, we put our investors' money to good use, extreme uh, positive returns, uh, positive delivery on the return. Absolutely wonderful. And I'm, I'm very happy that we were to do th able to do things so efficiently. Another note is that 10% of that total expenditure has gone directly into Indigenous owned businesses and employees. So if you consider consider that half of the total expenditures was spent on airborne geophysics, then our contribution towards Indigenous businesses and employees greatly exceeds 10%. So that's part of our commitment moving forward with, with Indigenous groups within the area. But we can't ignore Beckett. Beckett is what drove us to the area in the first place and to Hook. We really liked everything we saw in the geophysics, and we still like the area. We, we reported a, a lot of anomalous radioactivity in the area. You can see three drill holes there that had uh, what I would say would be lower radioactivity intervals. And they were all coming from pegmatite. Not a bad thing. But when you start to see pegmatite that looks like this, that has clear indications that it has been sheared and remobilized and just the structure is starting to come through there, you can even see hematite along the cracks so that the, the red fluid is there. That's exciting. This is the type of rock that you can, you can break apart and then you can mobilize uranium along it. Excellent area to start exploring it. And we also noticed that there were fractures, there were cracks and little, uh, little voids with yellow uranium mineral staining. So again, these, these type of minerals are, they're fluid rich. They've got the water radicals. So indicates that there has been uranium and water in mix that have gone in towards the system. And on the right hand side, just looks like a mini redox front right along a, another fracture. So the fluids seem like they're there. Even looking at the structure, and here's that, uh, here's a uh, hematite breccia as well. The structures are very similar, just it wasn't as, as uh, widespread as what we see at Accio. However, of super excitement was within the first drill hole, hole, hole one, the very bottom of the core in the last meter, we intersected that. That's a hematite breccia, similar to what I just showed at the top of Accio, similar to what I just showed at the aero deposit. And what that indicates to me is that we are still too high up in the system, that this is still fluids are moving down into the structures within the area. And if they're uraniferous, they would be further down. So we took that into note and said, okay, well, you know, we're trying to discover something near a surface. So let's hold off on Beckett. And let's, you know, let's reanalyze what's going on here. And then that's when we made the decision to go up to, to the Accio area. We also, we also went exploring around Geiki. We had a news release out uh, earlier in August with uh, high levels of airborne radiometrics discovered uh, some surface showings. We haven't reported those results yet, but they will be down the road. As we're prospecting out there, especially in this one area, up strike of where these radioactivity radioactive occurrences were we started noted we started finding number of these boulders here we go again this is hematite this is hematite structures these are the same type of rocks within within arrow within other deposits and you can see the brittle nature of this rock we picked it up smashed it and it just shattered into pieces but that to me that indicates that this has to be proximal this has to be very close to the source from which the glaciers plucked it from this can't have gone far because it would not have survived the journey and just to show some more of these examples these are these hematite rich quartz veined breccia systems that are fluid pathways so when we consider that you know, we're down ice from where we want to be and we start looking up ice and we can start identifying new target as new target areas for exploration so it, hook is hook is an amalgamation of a number of targets from the drilling that we've completed at beckett and at accio so far we have redeveloped our 
um, basically our interpretation of the of the gravity results that you're seeing here. We haven't shown our reinterpretation of it, but we have now been able to uh, what I would say is refine our targets. Then they look absolutely exciting based on what we know now. So the future, in my honest opinion, looks very bright for for Hook, not just for Accio, but for the entire Hook project alone. I have to remember that that base load is not a one project story. We do have other projects that we think are equally as exciting as Hook, such as Shadow and Catharsis, and we also. You know, so so the exploration strategy that we're we're looking for in those is that we are looking for uh, the conductive type targets, the classic type of exploring for conductors, but without the sandstone. So when you have a scenario like this, and you and you assume that there's base mineralization here, you'd have to follow it at depth. However, what we may have seen, and what we do believe is the sandstone was a lot larger at the time. And this is what it looks like today. So it's been eroded, something similar to, to this. We believe that there are islands of sandstone that are on the outliers of the Athabasca Basin. They could be for quite a ways. We know there's an outlier uh, pretty far to the southeast of the Athabasca, about 100, 100 kilometers away. That's uh, part of these little islands of sandstone. So this just opens up the entire idea that there are multiple areas for near surface, shallow, unconformity style of mineralization. And one of my presentations that I did a, a while ago kind of emphasizes that on the catharsis project, how, how the sands up there uh, look pretty good, some of the sandstone boulders that we found. So what this also does is it takes you outside of the basin as a whole, and now you're looking and now you can start finding at the Basque, uh, the traditional unconformity deposits that could be mineable with open pit strategies near surface. This is the excitement that we see at Hook, Catharsis, and Shadow. So again, you, you throw in the sandstone there. You won't see the sandstone because it's covered by musk eggs and overburden, but they could be there underneath that glacial. So now you're not just looking for these these conductive style deposits but you get the added bonus of unconformity style of, of deposits and to be very honest there are more unconformity hosted deposits than there are basement hosted deposits within the whole basin area so this is this is a new style of exploration for the athabasca basin and catharsis again we we now, Catharsis is one of these projects that we really love. We stake some new ground onto it. We've got a number of high-grade occurrences at surface that have all been reported to have some sort of structural controls on them. This just keeps speaking to, to me that this is the right area, that Catharsis is a magnificent area. And now that we've learned uh, a lot from the, the gravity results on hook, we can take those learnings and apply it to the gravity survey that we had completed over catharsis and really refine a lot of our, our targets that way. So very exciting times for, for catharsis. And of course, the shadow project is another project that we've really loved, that we really love and definitely want to see this thing get going. The potential on shadow with all of the conductors and the bifurcations and structural controls there, absolutely phenomenal but looking for those, those island type of situations that they're, and especially considering that the Virgin River shear zone is such a major structure, there could very well be some valleys that just haven't been eroded and have preserved Athabasca sandstone. As David mentioned, we're in a huge bull market. Bull market, just, it's almost like a powder keg of uh it's almost like a powder keg just waiting to go if you look back uh, to between 2005 2007 uh, it took almost 12 months plus 12 months to climb from 35 dollars a pound to 50 dollars a pound whereas we just saw that happen within just over two weeks with sprout buying up a lot of uh, a lot of the inventory it's a powder keg i think the the whole the, 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 the sprot action has really shown that there is volatility in the in the spot price in the uranium market as a whole. And you now this this could lead to to much more prolonged uh, uranium market. So we just completed a raise as mentioned, we raised $7.6 million, which puts us at $11 million in the bank. 
currently, we've got 65.1 million shares outstanding, uh, 38.8 million shares in warrants and options as well. The share price as of yesterday is 75 cents, which gives us a market cap of uh, close to 50, 50 million. Insiders control about 30% of the, of the company, whereas institutional, institutional investors about 40% and the retail investors about 30%. So we're very cashed up to see Hook go forward and our other projects move forward. We're very happy with everything that we've done. We're hoping that we can maintain our, um, our level of uh, efficient exploration so that we can, when we do get down to, to catharsis or even to exploring more targets on Hook, that we can, we can make these discoveries for, for less than a million dollars, really increasing our, our use of, of shareholder funds. Proven team, very exciting team. Uh, we've got a lot of a lot of strong backing behind us with with the companies here. Uh, QC Copper and Gold, who's basically our, our sister company. Uh, yeah, check out QC Copper and Gold. Have a nice big resource on the go. Management and board. That's who we are. Excellent group of gentlemen involved. And that's Baseload Energy. We are targeting near surface high grade hosted deposits, and we're hoping that Accio has proven to be one of those. Obviously more drill holes will need to go into the ground to figure that out, to see if this does become a, uh, a viable high grade deposit. And that's something that we will be working towards on our end. We've got great projects, amazing management and board with proven track records, and we're very well capitalized to see our exploration efforts move forward. You can always contact us uh, online through our website, or you can contact me directly below at my email address. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for watching this exciting project and seeing how it has grown so far and where it will grow in the future. Thank you very much, James. A very informative presentation. So we are going to kick off the Q&A portion of the webinar right now. A reminder to everyone on the line, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. And we already have several questions and comments, James. Uh, you, you do have some happy shareholders on the line here. They love your vision and passion. So uh, first off, I guess, congratulations on what could turn into a new uranium discovery. Thank you. So, you know, over the past 15 years, I rarely use the word discovery when talking about initial scintillometer results, and especially without assays. Uh, but a uranium discovery along trend is why I chose to use the term uh, this time around. So, but, you know, if you wouldn't mind, could you, could I ask where the name Accio came from? Yeah, Accio, we have now decided to capitalize it because it it's a palindrome derived from the first initials of our field crew who spent the summer working out at Catharsis and Hook. So that's, it's, uh, it's our way of saying thank you to, to the gals and guys who put their time and effort into, into moving this forward this summer. Okay, perfect. Thank you, and congratulations to them as well. Now, first off, and this becomes from a couple of questions here, can you define the geological term unconformity? You know, is it, it's mostly used in respect to uranium, de uranium deposits, and maybe spend a second to differentiate what a basement-hosted deposit is versus something at the, conf the unconformity or perched into the sandstone. To be technical, an unconformity is really a it's a stop in time it it it's a geological feature that shows that there has been a um i guess a change in time uh or a, a lack of in our case and with the sandstone lack of deposition over time so you've had your basement rocks exposed that surface uh, 1.8 billion years ago and there was nothing on top of them but as the mountains around them continue to erode and start to fill up with the sandstone uh, 100 million years later, or even maybe 15 million years later, that gap in time between no sandstone to sandstone is represented by that unconformity. So that's, that's basically all it is. It also provides a nice fluid pathway because of the competency contrast between your basement rocks, which uh, the simplest way to think about basement rocks are just granites. And I'm pretty sure everyone out there knows what a granite is. You've walked on the rocks, you know, rocks are hard. 
And so basement rocks are really hard, whereas the sandstone is basically just a lithified version of sands that you can go walk out on the beach. Uh, so lithified just meaning that it's all cemented together, but there's still porosity in there. So that unconformity is that that layer, that, that separation gap, which is minuscule, not even millimeter thin. It's that time gap between when the sandstones were deposited and when the unconformity or when when the basement rocks had no cover. Difference between unconformity mineralization and, and basement hosted mineralization, I think has a lot to do with structure for sure. And just the, the pumping mechanisms and just how the fluids move around. Uh, and the, one of the problematic things is you can't really take, uh, you can't really take an unconformity deposit and make a one-to-one -one comparison with another unconformity deposit. They've all got their own little variables in place and it's, it, it, it does kind of throw wrenches and things, but it, it provides you with end members basically on both your unconformity style deposits have end members and your basement hosted deposits have end members. Uh, typically from, from what I find is that your, your basement hosted deposits are a little bit more widespread, a little bit more dispersed, uh, maybe even lower grades. Whereas your unconformity deposits are classically your, your higher grade style deposits because everything is, is concentrating right at that, uh, at that unconformity, at that dilation that was provided there. And if you start thinking about uh, a lot of the fluid mechanics and the pumping mechanisms, again, there are reasons for all of that. Uh, there's more time for fluids to migrate down passively in a basement hosted scenario than there is in the quick little pump action. Uh, so San Andreas fault, fault moves, everyone feels the tremors. You feel it for a little time, 100 years later, it happens again. 100 years later is that dilatancy, that tremor activity, that's your fault moving. That's where you can get these unconformity style deposits. Just they build up during those active faults and not really during the, the passive fault, fault fluid mechanism. Okay, no, thank you for that. I think that will help uh, help a lot of us out. Uh, so you did mention this in, the, in your talk, and now we have terms straightened out. We are talking about basement hosted mineralization. So, you know, what other deposits do you look to for examples? You know, I, I know uh, I look to Eagle Point Mine of Cameco or Arrow of Next Gen, Triple R of Fission, Griffin of Denison. Uh, what, what comes to mind first for you? Griffin? Griffin comes first. Well, sorry, no. Griffin is is definitely something that I look to, as well as Raven Horseshoe. But the one that really does come first to me is Rough Rider. Uh, Rough Rider mm -hmm. is is one of these classic type of basement host deposits. It was very near the unconformity, but just seeing the alteration uh, within those pictures and and seeing the the variable. I guess the the variable thicknesses and concentration of hematite uh, that you have in this in this bleached area just screams to me rough rider. And while I was at while I was at Rio Tinto uh, after they bought out Hathor, that was one of the projects that I started working on that I gave myself was start mapping out these fluid pathways uh, along the structures using the redox fronts as as a guide. And you can see them. You can see them move. They you can see the fluids go up and down and left and right so it's it's not easy but once you start putting it all together you paint yourself a nice little picture and it, it really starts to make sense arrow arrow i would say that we're probably dissimilar from arrow uh, it's a little bit different of a of a structural control over on the west side that everything along that whole Patterson Lake shear zone seems to be concentrated more so as discrete veins, which again, you get, you get in a lot of these other deposits. We saw many discrete veins in Rough Rider, just from what I've seen so far based on the, on the 92 energy drill hole and ours, I have not seen the evidence of discrete veins yet. That's not to say it's not gonna happen. Very possible that neither of us have drilled in the right location. Okay. No, in interesting you say Rough Rider, you know, that's a polymetallic uh, deposit, uranium deposit. You know, I, I remember being on site there and seeing uh, bright pinks and, and liquid blues dripping, literally dripping off the core. So should we see some molly or nickel or cobalt or heaven forbid arsenic in, on, uh, in this uh, discovery area? I agree. Heavenly forbid arsenic and selenium, but we, we, 
we have intentionally left the core out before we have sampled it to try and identify any anomalous uh, metal blooms. Okay. And we've, we've got over 200 meters of alteration. I think it's closer to 300 meters of just altered core. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it's, it's fantastic and blasted. So yeah, we want to pick up on any sort of uh, metallogeny that does exist within the area. Funny enough that you did mention that, uh, we almost started using, or at least <laughs> what I've learned from, from my days at Rough Rider, is that you can start to use the different metallogenies as a potential vector. Now, I know a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, you know, you, they, you go out and you analyze copper, moly, and nickel, and you say, oh, these are all pathfinders to uranium. But there was a specific way that it occurred at Rough Rider that you can you can almost see when, when certain elements get deposited within the system same thing as like these these pearls on a string they're all going to come out at different uh redox events of their own and so you can start using that so if we do have any other any other uh, polymetallic minerals in this or elements in this then that's one of the ways that we will use our our exploration knowledge to refine our targets and really pinpoint into the what we would consider to be the juicier areas Okay, thank you. Now, were you surprised to see those sandstone units when you were drilling? And, and would you rather have not seen those that sandstone? My expectation is that actually opens up some new opportunities for you. Absolutely. Yeah, we were, yes to both. We were surprised and shocked that we saw the sandstone. And to be honest, when I saw the sandstone in, in the pictures and some of them that I showed there, as I said earlier, they didn't scream to me as, as something that has seen the typical unconformity style of alteration or, or near, like near Rough Rider. Rough Rider had some blasted sandstones and this didn't look anything like it. These look far fresher, if I had to say that. So pretty early on, uh, before we started to hit, I had a little bit of doubt saying, oh, geez, you know, maybe this, maybe the gravity and all is the sandstone here. Uh oh, uh, but obviously we persevered and we kept true and we we did make that discovery but yeah the sandstone it just it opens up that whole new level it's unconformity style mineralization uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be there but it just it adds that potential and so we will put a large emphasis of trying to find where we where we can find the right structure that would intersect that unconformity because right now we're on the football side we're we're confident we're on the football side of a major structure within the area whereas uh, the 92 E hole is on the hanging wall side. Neither of us have really hit this, this, the proper structural area yet. So hopefully it is, hopefully it will be unconformity style because that, again, our unconformity is within 50 meters of surface. Whereas where, where we're seeing mineralization right now is between 110, 130 meters from surface. So if we can get, if we can prove that there is mineralization closer to surface, this just looks more attractive to everybody looking at, uh, at this thing. Yeah. So if you know where you are on the structure and you know where the structure hits the unconformity and you know where the unconformity is, you know where you need to test next. That's it. Okay, okay. Uh, any signs of desolicification, solicification, dravite? You know, maybe explain to us some of the uh, of the alteration that you're seeing here. Yeah, it's, well, I'll tackle them both. Really. So the sandstone, there's clear signs of solicification. That, that fault offset that I showed, that is a solicified area. You can see the quartz running right through that, that healed offset within the sandstone. As far as desolicification goes, not really so much in the sandstone, um, not really much in, in the clays as well. Uh, it's, it's been very devoid of clays, which again, it, it's, that's nothing bad. We're just, we're foot wall side of the fault system. We wouldn't expect to see really uh, something to, you know, we're still distal from where the, the main fault could be. Whereas in the basement side, uh, just massive alteration seeing those those hematite structures and that just speaks highly to the to the type of deposit that we're looking for uh, clay alteration chloride alteration uh, for almost 200 meters and and good strong alteration so it's it's a huge plumbing system and that's it it has 
the right fluids. It's had uh, it's had uranium bearing fluids to it. As far as dravite, we do have uh, at least my my colleague Cameron. He had sent a picture, and it, it we did have some clays that are potentially dravite. We will get them analyzed, and if it is dravite, well, that's again that's another huge vector for us to use, as dravite is commonly associated with uh, with uranium deposits. Not all of them, but it's it has its place in the scheme of systems. Okay, thanks. And you know, maybe just stepping back here to cobalt and nickel, because the question came on. You know, you do do appear to be on strike with West Bear. Uh, do you have any signs of standalone cobalt or nickel uh, as a cobalt nickel deposit? Because you know, when I was mentioning Rough Rider, that was more of a you know a, a minor uh, mineral associated with the uranium. Don't know yet. We don't know yet. I haven't heard anything about any blooms. Uh, my, I haven't. I haven't asked my colleagues for it. Just, I'm going up to site tomorrow, so I'll see everything firsthand. But yeah, I, we haven't sampled anything yet. Again, just I want to see the core and get a really, get a really strong perspective and overview of the core and and just hit some some fine tooth details on it and see if we can really pick up the structures. But if yeah, if there are any blooms, we will sample and we will report when assays come out. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have a large quartzite on site like you find at MacArthur River, you know, close to mineralization at Hook? You know, I, I know that provides a competency contrast, but do you uh, do you see a need for it if you've already got the ground prep anyways, the faulting? No, we don't have a need for it. We haven't seen it either, but we don't have a need for it. Uh, we've seen enough differences locally uh, to to derive some competent contrast between the different rock types within the areas so that that does a fair enough job as it is catharsis on the other hand does have a quartzite within it uh, quite a large extensive quartzite so that's another it's one of the reasons why we really like catharsis Okay, uh, you know, back to this uh, 16, meter, 16 meter intercept you have. Right now, we only have scintillometer results. They reported yesterday. So, which means what to you? Means, well, the other thing that we've done, uh, we did not say, is that we ran the, a spectral scintillometer over it. Now, the spectral scintillometer is supposed to distinguish between uranium, thorium, and potassium. And our results came back as being predominantly uranium. So we're, we're comfortable that this is a, a uraniferous interval uh, and, and, and plumbing system. But, uh, sorry, repeat the question there. No, I, I'm just trying to get to the point, you know, you these are scintillometer results right now. You've put out scintillometer results. You haven't put out any assays, right? you know, we still have to go through that process. So why uh, why put out scintillometer results? Why put out the scintillometer results? Because we do feel very strongly that this is a urinifer system, as, as just mentioned with the with the spectrometer, but also our neighbors to the north, which is only 450 meters away, uh, they have shown their assay results are uriniferous as well. We feel that the, we are along the same structural corridor, right along strike of them. So it just it kind of kind of makes sense that that we are seeing uh, uranium. Why wait? why wait or why not uh, i guess why wait why not wait geez until the until the assay results come out it's you'd be looking at about two to four weeks turnaround and for us with the way the market is right now we just thought it was the optimal time to really get the news out there and really push the story uh you know such as what we're doing today so everything just kind of made sense and uh Again, with the 92E results out there, having the SINT results, having the assay results out there, it just it provided us with a unique opportunity to sit there and make direct comparisons uh, from with, with, with CPS results as well. It is common in the industry for people to report CPS, especially when they're on their own discoveries. It's just it's one of these benefits we have working with with radioactive materials that, that we can do such things. Yeah, and no, and then that nearby discovery is exactly why I use the word discovery when looking at scent results in the, in this case. So, um, are you concerned about disequilibrium uh, it, on the property? Maybe we need to identify what disequilibrium is. 
disequilibrium in the uranium partial versus total is if that's what we're assuming then uh no not really concerned about it at all especially seeing seeing the alteration system this is this is something that moves fluids this is not a small system this is uh, this is the type of system that would leach everything from from the minerals around it and redeposit it or even if 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 the if all of the uranium is coming from the sandstone and we're seeing the uh the these quartz breaches then we've got the void we've got the plumbing system that intersects the the unconformity and brings whatever uranium is in those fluids down into the area as well i've i have no fear about these disequilibrium in the area but to tell you the truth we actually use it as a, as a vector tool as well you can you can start mapping out which areas or which directions and you know that you that your fluids are stronger and and where has been the most um uh, which which have been the most affected uh, fluid pathways. Right. Okay. Now, your anomalous radioactivity is about the same level on average as the nearby 92 energy discovery, uh, but your intercepts about triple the thickness. You know, where, might we be looking at some stacked units here, uh, differences in the structurally controlled environment? You know, your your intercept is much shallower as well. Would, would we expect more intercepts at depth? I think that's a good possibility. I would think that eh, we we can provide a more accurate answer with more drilling. It's just that's the unfortunate thing is it's one hole on each side of the project, and because of the the alteration that we're seeing, it's really hard to get uh, some sort of vector on on the structural controls, or even start to really understand the structural controls in the area. Uh, kind of why i said that this is different from arrow is arrow did not have such widespread alteration system arrow was very tight so we were able to use oriented core measurements very quickly on our first drill hole to to literally map out the the structural nature of what became the arrow deposit and it didn't change from hole one unfortunately we can't do this with this drill hole it's it will take more drill hole uh, information to start to start piecing all of that together Okay, so more drilling. Now, when might we expect more results and what are they? Are they going to be uh, sent results for new holes or when might we look for assays? Assays we're hoping within two to four weeks, especially from the first hole, but we are going to continue drilling. So we just completed the first hole on Monday and we've taken we've taken a few days off just to get things all prepped up before we start drilling again we had to bring a separator to site fortunately enough between uh, Cameron who's up at the field and myself we both worked on the uranium deposits we both know the uh, the regulations that are involved for working with with drill holes and dealing with radioactive cuttings so we've taken these uh, we've taken this time to put everything together to get it all up to site and the truck is on its way now so we're hoping to have the drill turning again by by tomorrow and so we will continue drilling as long as possible as long as the weather stays uh, stays good for us we are getting into winter so you start getting into colder uh, colder nights, water lines could potentially freeze, but it's also because we're helicopter supported, as we get closer towards winter, we lose daylight hours. And so you don't have as much time to fly with the helicopter and that poses a problem in itself. So we, we have to start thinking about all these and we will judge, um, we'll judge when it's time to shut down the project uh, in consideration of the, the safety of all of our crew up at site. But then CPS results, I think, would be a good thing for us to continuously push out as they become available and assay results as well as they become available. Okay. And as everything freezes up, uh, you, now we've got the winter season ahead of us, which means you probably don't need the helicopter support, correct? Or, correct. or do you, are you, are you far enough away? Can you get people to site uh, quickly? It would require a trail, but we, we would need a trail and a camp to go in, but that's, that's in the works and the planning for, for the winter. Okay. So back, back onto that EM conductor. It's about 1,500 meters long, 350 meters wide. Are you using that guy, That as a guide for uh, where you're going to drill next? For, oh, for Accio, uh, yeah. we're going to try and use more of the drill holes, which is why our initial, uh, what we want to do initially is complete the fence that we're working on. 
So we want to put in a, you know, a few drill holes as such so we can start seeing the geology uh, within that cross section and that will help us guide where we explore going north and south. And so that's that's what we have to get done first. Will we need or will we use the EM and the gravity as a guide? Uh, right now, I do think that they are very widespread and they, they don't really pinpoint you into exact location, especially because they are airborne surveys. And some of these, like our, our gravity survey was flown at 400 meter line spacing. So it's, you, know, you, you don't get precision with that. So we will we'll consider it after the after this drill season if we require any additional ground geophysics to really refine target areas. But for now, we will continue on with the drilling. But we will use the EM and the gravity anomaly as basically a bound and learn from that as well. Okay. It, this whole yeah. system could be could be larger than the EM anomaly. That was my next question because we've made comparisons to Rough Rider, right? Rough Rider was an off conductor uh, deposit. So, can mineralization exist along trend uh, or at depth and be off conductor here? Yes, it can. Okay, so we don't need to cap this at fifteen hundred meter long deposit. It can be. It can change shape. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Now, does this early hit change the way you're going to explore uh, timelines or strategy? I, I think we've already seen it. You're you're starting to focus on it. You're going to drill it as long as you can. But. Yeah, for sure. We I, Accio deserves the attention that it that it's going to get. Uh, because it is shallow, that allows us for uh, more drill holes into an area than some of our peers would. So our exploration dollar will go that much further and we can we can get more done. Uh, I, uh, maybe I'm being overly optimistic here and saying that we can come out with a with an initial resource uh, by the end of the winter drilling. Um, so I'm not going to really push that into things, but it, it, it's a possibility and we will try to achieve that if we can. But I th yeah, for moving forward, especially for the winter, this has changed a lot of what we had planned to do. Uh, I would I would say that it's very safe that we put all of our efforts into uh, just expanding Accio and trying to trying to get to that resource stage if we can, and then we would come back to to do a more exploration style of of, of drilling on both hook and and uh, catharsis for the summertime because it, it allows us to come back to helicopter operations now we like helicopter operations simply because they they have such a low impact on the ground it's the best time so with accio accio would be a great place for winter and summer operations because it's limited to one little area whereas classic or historic exploration if you're drilling in the winter you, know, you could be putting in 10 kilometer trails just to get to a drill site we want to avoid that as much as possible so that's why we'd like to do a lot of the our pending exploration drilling on hook catharsis and hopefully even shadow by that point uh, with with the helicopter in the summertime okay great thank you uh another teachable moment here grade versus counts per second cps because the scent results are putting out cps and the question came in what is that in what is x or let's say a thousand cps in percentage of u308 now Can't, you know these no. are not linear systems no. they're not as accurate as prober assays do you make any comparison whatsoever from scents to uh, to a grade I do personally, I kind of have some numbers that I work around with, like typically in those pegmatites that we're seeing at Beckett, uh, when you're at 200 to 250 CPS in a pegmatite like that, you can assume that it's 0.01% uh, U308 or 100 ppm U308, and you can kind of go up from there. But to make direct comparisons, no, it, it's, it's not really that possible, which is why I showed the 92E hole to, to make that, that more uh, justifiable comparison with with what we could have uh, one of the things because you have to remember see we're, we're dealing with a lot of alteration here now alteration is basically going to be clay if you have little little nuggets of your ananite in your drill core and it's covered in clay it is not going to emit as much radiation as as your scintillometer is picking up because the clay would actually uh it, it would uh, stop that radiation from from emanating fully so that's that's why we you know we we sample uh, to lower thresholds of radioactivity, typically around two hundred and fifty to three hundred cps, just to to make sure that we don't miss anything. And okay. it's, it's just kind of the same thing with with probe. 
you can go down with gamma probe data, but gamma probe data could be picking up something that's a meter of weight that's not in your core. So you can't get a direct one-to-one -one that way either. Right, right. Okay. Now, have you considered waiting for more news out of 92E before deciding what to do next in the area? And do you see any synergies or working, uh, you know, ideas of working together? This this reminds me of the next-gen fission uh, early days all over again. We both lived through that. So. Yep. <laughs> yes, we did. Uh, I can actually see a lot of synergies. I've had a lot of ideas running through my head, and I think it would be to both of our company's benefits is to is to get some of these synergies going and really, really make this happen as an aerial play instead of both companies trying to really trying to beat each other. Yeah, sure, it'll be friendly competition to see who's got who's going to end up with with the better side of, of what's going on. But to get to that point, we can really help each other out in a number of different fashions. So that's that's my goal, and that's kind of what I'm going to be pushing on uh, moving forward for sure. Why why wait for 92E? Because they're not there anymore. They pulled the rig out. They pulled everything out. Uh, we were up there drilling anyway, so we figured, yeah, let's just keep going. We'll be the guys to you know to really build the story, and uh, it'll benefit 92E moving forward as well. So it's it's all part of that. It's all part of that uh, communal system, really trying to uh, help each other out going forward. They they made the discovery, and we followed up. Okay. And uh, we had about 10 people ask if you had any contact with your neighbors to the north since the discovery. I said hello. Congrats on the race. Congrats on the intersections. <laughs> we'll update as, okay. as we know more. Good, good. Okay, we are at the top of the hour, so there's a, just a, a couple more questions uh, that I want to get in here, and then we can let people go. Um, you know, some uh, some view some viewers say they're in base load for the shadow project. Anything else from Hook and Catharsis is gravy. So you provided some pretty thick gravy. <laughs> you know, what what can we expect uh, elsewhere from work from elsewhere this year? For the rest of this year. Uh, I guess the only thing we've got that we still have to complete is a VTEM survey over catharsis, which we're eagerly anticipating to get going within the next couple of weeks. We had tried to get it going in June, but there were so many complications with the forest fires in the area, uh, technical issues that we had to abandon the survey uh, after they completed about 15% of it. So now they have to come back and, and finish off the survey. So we're eagerly anticipating that because like Cook, like catharsis, like Shadow, our Catharsis, we, we've got a lot of faith in, in the catharsis that we stake the right area, that we see the right structures, uh, that this is an area that will generate fluid movement. Yeah, uh, you know, for all of our initial investors who got into Shadow, absolutely, we still we still love Shadow. We think it's one of the greatest projects we've ever seen in our lives, just like Catharsis, just like Hook. We staked, we believe we staked in the right area. And you know, without without having the drill hole, to be able to tell you that, hey, look, you've got mineralization. We like to believe that there is something down there, and it's just just a matter of time, hopefully, before we can uh, before we can poke a hole in there. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, are there any updates to the progress of indigenous indigenous relations regarding the shadow project? You know, is is that shadow project going to move forward soon? Are you going to be able to get boots on ground? Unfortunately, I can't provide any any clarity on that. Uh, it the, our discussions with the with the indigenous communities in the area have been progressing. Uh, they have been moving forward. Uh, it, it's you know everything's back to an amicable uh, conversation between both parties. It's just they, they do want to develop uh, their own their own consultation uh, group, I guess. So that's kind of at the point that we are at, and just, just waiting for for them to have. Uh, I guess this this new consultation board set up, and we will continue talks. Okay, and uh, I guess last question here: You just closed an equity raise. You know how much cash do you have now, and are you seeing more institutional attention and investment this year? Absolutely, yeah. It was it was kind of the reason that we did this raise is there was and there was an amazing call for. For institution trying to get into maybe maybe the uranium space as general, but they definitely wanted into baseload. Uh, looks like they timed things right too, but yeah, the institutions have definitely been salivating for for uh, for uranium companies in the junior space. Okay, perfect. 
Well, why don't we leave it there, James, uh, from Baseload Energy. I appreciate you joining us today. Thanks very much, David, and everybody else in attendance. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. A reminder that Red Cloud Securities will be back Monday afternoon when Tim Lee sits down with Canada Nickel. That's October 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And a reminder for everybody to sign up for our virtual Oktoberfest mining conference. So far, we have 73 companies confirmed over three days. That's October 18th, 19th, 20th. That includes 17 uranium stocks, such as Baseload Energy. Plus, we've got uh, John from Sprott Physical Uranium Trust going to be uh, giving a keynote on the 20th. So anybody can sign up for that. It's at redcloudfs.com. Have a great day. Thank you very much.